Welcome back to High Performance Computing, our practical lecture 1.1, short introduction to C programming and scheduling. We have the second part and we learned in the first part really how to do a very simple C program. Uh, it's about a Hello World program that was executed on the so-called login node. So you will find a lot of HPC systems that always have let's say several login nodes or one login nodes, which are completely different from the environment as a compute node. And we will come back into this also in the second part of the lecture. You also learned that we have a module environment, so we will pick up on this also now in the second part, which is one part of the HPC environment that you usually face when you go to a high performance computing center, when you use their systems, and it doesn't matter if it's in the Ulich Supercomputing Center that you know already a little bit from Germany. It doesn't matter if you go to Jutun in Iceland. It doesn't matter if you go to the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and using Mare Nostrum, uh, that the one that we discussed already in the church, right, which is a quite interesting setup. So all of them share those HPC environments. And also this is true for the schedulers. All of those HPC systems usually have schedulers that enable a multi-user usage of these HPC systems. There's also some quite movement of making this across the different HPC systems as homogeneous as you can. It's not always possible that different HPC architectures, the different vendors, but still the schedulers in a way, and also the modular environment in a way are a little bit like, you know, vendor agnostic. So, you will find parts of that, you know, different vendors have still the same scheduler and still the same module environment. However, then to the deep details, of course, when you think how much memory is available, how many compute cores are available, or how many accelerators are available, this might be different. Also, you think about that the module environment has different software installed, right? So this means also this is different, but the point is how to use those modules, how to use those schedulers is very similar. Also, if you have different schedulers, we will think and learn about Slurm because this is what we have in the deep test cluster in Jülich, but this is also what we have at Jötun in Iceland. There are also different cluster systems uh, around the world. Torque is one of them and, and many others. But uh, the key message to take away really is that once you mastered these HPC environment tools like scheduling today uh, and also let's say a little bit working with a module environment with SSH, uh, you really are let's say quite well prepared to use HPC systems which are around Europe, Asia, US and I think around the world. So this is basically a common way how we use and operate these HPC systems. You have seen there are differences sometimes with the login with SSH uh, some and the majority perhaps today really use SSH keys and very well protected, maybe just to be accessed from a particular IP address to also reduce the risk of hackers. But also you will see, you know, people like we, um, we can just use Uton with a small, let's say, teaching cluster with username and password, but then being protected by smart network ideas of, you know, different uh, zones where you can log in and access then these HPC systems. But this is not something which is really the material of today. I just want to show you why we have this as a practical lecture, why it's directly at the start of the lecture. Of course, firstly, it is something what you can reuse again, generally, if you want to work in this field. Secondly, it's of course also what we will use in our assignment. So every time you submit a job in your assignment, please use a scheduler don't be just on the login node. And this is an important part and we will really try to have the second part of the lecture to show you the benefits, to show you why that is needed, what's the point in it, why a scheduler is useful. Of course, on the other hand, it's not a complete scheduling uh, lecture. You would find in other university lectures, lots of large uh, scheduling lectures, which are actually very interesting and very uh, well, to the point, there are lots of scheduling strategies, there are different schedulers, there's a different modus operandi, but still the look and feel of all of this is relatively similar that we kind of summarize in the second part here to get you prepared roughly for the HPC systems. So <clears throat> when we look at this, we want to be basically 
thing a little bit about the systems we have. Um, we said there's the deep series of projects. It's one example of our deep cluster where we going to access uh, in later parts of the course the system. And of course, these systems then also um, basically create and work on Slurm, on this scheduler that we talked about in order to do, you know, kind of extensions to the scheduler, thinking about modular supercomputing we had already prepared before. So this is a quite interesting thing to think about that this, of course, the schedulers, this domain is research in itself. So in a one way, it is a little bit like, you know, we have different threads on a different operating system. So you have to schedule them for CPU capacity. It's a little bit like this, but on the other hand, think about that these architectures are keep continuously changing. Now we have accelerators. We hadn't, we didn't have this 15 years ago or 16 years ago when I started in HPC. There, there were no GPUs, right? GPUs was for gaming. So this has no role in HPC today. This has an impact in scheduling. So just saying again that, of course, the role of scheduling the way how we think about maybe perhaps too much about compute centric in the last 10 years where we have to have scheduling strategies and some projects will work on this in the research domain like admire that think about scheduling in a much more data intensive way um, and we will come to this in subsequent lectures so from this again i would like to point out the the strategy that we had of this modular supercomputing however and this is a message i want to bring here with this um, slide today is really wherever you look here in the past when i started maybe in Yulich 16 years ago uh, in 2004 really uh, with thomas lipper together we had just a whole completely whole full of this power four systems and they had already a scheduler so the scheduler was a specific one called load leveler from EBM directly. So not Slurm that we will learn more about today, but you get the a sense that this scheduling is really something that is inherent in HPC. And why we do this? Because some users would have highly scalable loads and some users would ha have general purpose loads on this power four system. Of course, then learning from this uh, requirements from users, we more and more came to the idea that there are these different workloads and there's not one, let's say, architecture of a HPC system alone that can, that can really capture this. And in this way, we developed a kind of dual systems in the past where you have maybe here the EBM Power 6 system, um, which were really high single thread performance again, very powerful cores, general purpose, uh, and then we continue to Europa. But on the other hand of the scale, really, we developed the Blue Gene kind of uh, series of systems. And I told you already, um, it's an interesting and also partly maybe tragic part that EBM stopped the series because we adopting it for the Blue Gene L. That was a specific architecture. And for the petaflop domain, we actually went to Blue Gene P. And then actually we moved to Blue Gene Q. And, and essentially, this was really a kind of straightforward move. But again, we had load leveler as an example of a scheduler, really, along the path. So this just shows that software sometimes comes with vendors. So here we were kind of bound to load leveler, where maybe others use Torque, LSF, or actually also maybe uh, already Slurm. But um, then when we continue in the future, we see that you know there were more and more other architectures when we moved on essentially in the idea of being you know uh, innovative in creating new systems where we already had impacts of this deep project i just showed you of thinking about a more modular approach of this so a proof of concept where we thought that we need always kind of a cluster in the booster model um, oh, at that point in time, it was more proof of concept, but what you see now, and as I was already alluding to in lecture one, now we have really a modular supercomputer setup. We have the Jewels cluster and the Jewels scalable model. And in the video, you have seen, for instance, Sabine Griesbach telling about uh, how they can use it in the Earth system sciences, uh, really to their advantage to have these different modules. However, this, of course, means it has also some impact into scheduling users. 
So you have different modules on the supercomputer. You need to schedule them depending on which part of your software should be running where. So this is more the conceptual part of it so that you get more and more into the idea that actually scheduling sounds simple, like a normal operating system with a couple of threads or people that are actually in the Windows world, they know very well, I think the Task Explorer that shows you what, how the CPUs are used and maybe also the graphical uh, parts are used if you have a GPU in your system. But here we talk about the different orders of scale to really understand this. We have lots of lots of processes. We have lots of lots of accelerators in these systems. So here we have to have a software and this is really the motivation of the slide and of the motivation of this part here of this of second part of the lecture today. We need some managing entity of software that is keeping track of all the users, keeping track of really shipping essentially or moving your executable to the right cores, right? If you have 500,000 cores, you don't want to copy that essentially to the specific, let's say, core that is in question. Someone has to do that for you. And this is a scheduler. Someone has to keep track how long your job is, how long you plan your job. The job means usually something like how long you would execute your executable on these machines. So this is a job you would interconnect GPUs, you will use them in parallel. So how many of them you use? You use maybe 50, you use 100. Typically it's on the order of two to the something. So you use 20, you use maybe 1024 cores, but suddenly you realize there are just 800 available. That means you have to wait, but how long you wait and when you be basically the next in line, once 1024 cores become available, this is again a job of a scheduler. So you see HPC ecosystems have quite some tools where in the first place you would think modules are very simple, just a couple of applications bundled together, Think about that modules could have different versions, different applications on different of these HPC systems, so some quite some complexity. Think about the same way in a scheduler. So all of these systems are in a one way or another different. And we will look at this when we look at the load level view a little bit. But of course, also the idea of um, all the strategies behind it. So what happens if you have a very large job, you have to free capacity to get the large job, meaning maybe fitting half of the machine, really, then you have to have some strategy to gradually empty, you know, the queues, we call that queue, when you have to wait for your job or your task to be executed. And you basically have to free the jobs or the capacity of the system to really get scheduled on the different cores. The best to see that is really when you look and take a deeper look in our, let's say, maybe the most important screen that you would have as an example, of course, other centers in Europe and US and Asia have the same thing. They would have something which monitors all of their load, which shows exactly what, you know, all the people are doing. You see, in a one way, um, when you come to Jülich, in, I invite you to really be once a visitor of the Jülich Supercomputing Center. It's quite some interesting view on this, let's say, computing hall. But, you know, you see here, very much that this view is quite the most important view. So I don't mean the bridge here, which looks quite fancy and nice. It always is good to bridge different communities. But here we really think about these interesting, strange windows. So this is really, if you want to conclude on this, to say the most important screen, because this shows you how the supercomputers are used, what the workload is for the next hours. That's what we see here. And these are different systems. As you remember from my slide before, Juvils is now our cutting edge workhorse there. Uh, we have a booster and cluster, Jureka cluster, Jureka booster view, because they're different systems. One is for the general purpose cluster here with some GPUs, but then we have also the Jureka booster here for a really highly scalable load. You see automatically from a, let's say, three meters perspective and we will zoom in in a moment that the the workload is different you see here the cluster module has more let's say fine-grained smaller jobs but think about that each of the cpus each of the jobs here on the hpc machine are really really cutting edge 
number crunches, high single shirt performance again. Here on the booster again, we see very, very large fractions allocated. And this really is, is a key paradigm when you think about that it should be highly scalable jobs, meaning that here you don't execute something for just 16 cores. You don't execute something for maybe 1,024. You may not even be allowed to do so. There's scheduling policies that maybe forbid that you actually submit a very small job because then you kill, let's say, a little bit dramatically saying the schedule of the large jobs. You can imagine if there are lots of small jobs, they really take the capacity away of maybe having, let's say, half of the machine used, or as you see here, at least one rack or two racks used together. This is again, uh, then of course, an interesting consideration when you think about the workloads, something that would materialize also when we talk into the application about nest codes, what it really means to have the whole system used. So a little bit you see now, and I go back to the slide here, how this is in life really looking at Jureka cluster, Jureka booster. Here's a very conceptual slide where you would say, um, well, that is rather boring. There are lots of racks. Um, there's, you know, nothing happening, just a couple of CPUs running and I mean, actually no one is using it. The same as jewels, very nice. Yeah, looks like more racks, looks like more petaflop performance. And of course, these numbers are just, let's say, averaged. But here you see again now the lively activity. So this is a monitoring tool we go into deeper now. And you can imagine that this is really lots of change of the load of the systems. People use it in parallel all the time. And you can imagine that these systems are usually, if nothing goes wrong, roughly 99% utilized. So they will be not idle and just standing there. And you can imagine why it's also very costly machines and very required system for very specific computing. So there's not, let's say, usually a HPC system, which is out of um, basically out of, um, you know, having no users or something like this. Of course, you will see a different pictures if there's a scheduled maintenance. This is a complete normal idea that every now and then these systems have maintenance and there's nothing on it, nothing to be computed for a certain period something you will see on your welcome screen once you log into the system. Usually you see there in production environment and large clusters, we have a scheduled maintenance in one month and this will be taking four hours. And at that point of time, you can be seen that your jobs are not running on these large workhouses. But let's look a little bit more deeper into this. And I don't show this necessarily to think about this LL view program, which is actually giving rise to the slide, it must more clearly should capture the essence of two things. And one of them is really uh, perhaps three things. One of them is really that supercomputers are multi-users, right? So this is important. It's a very costly machine. It's lots of cores. And you can see here, so this is a ranking of all the different users and the systems. So you can imagine here, this is something to think about that you are together on the system with many, 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 many other users. They have different number of cores. The details here are not so important. However, you have to think about that now we are in a big system and you have seen the graphics already in previous lectures. You see that is a system looks like from the outer, but this is the system how it looks like from the inner. So there are different aspects to it. There's a different rack configuration, as we would call it, a different system, HPC system architecture. And with this comes also the idea how things are basically, you know, scheduled then on these different CPUs available. And of course, in Juvels and the Juvels booster, then we also talk about GPUs and accelerators. So in this sense, this gives you a very nice example of saying, this particular job here that I maybe executed some time ago is filling this particular rack with a couple of compute, you know, nodes and maybe also accelerators if you talk about the booster, for example. So in other words, this monitoring gives you a bit more look and feel how your HPC's uh, application is really executed on these systems. Of course, in the end, no matter how big the system is, there is a CPU put to work and it's maybe not one, it's the amount you specified. And we will learn this now that the scheduler is actually helping you in this. 
you have to specify how many cores and it will be coming actually much more in your let's say blood and veins when we use really MPI maybe with four with 16 uh, different cores and so on so in the end uh, basically you have to specify of course how much you need but the real location on the system is out of your control usually you know the scheduler takes care where to put it it will also know about those racks you see here on the top left this is a rack and a couple of racks that's maybe out of maintenance could be different reasons for this there could be a network issue could be lots of different let's say compute cores are you know kind of uh, not working anymore and have to be exchanged there are different reasons why certain parts of the system might be not available anymore so this is the second part really so somewhere in the system is running your job and the good news is you don't have to care about this you submit it to a so-called queue you have to wait when your number of cpus are available or of course accelerators and once this is let's say free and you are the first in line in your queue then you basically can be very certain that the scheduler is actually taking your C program, taking your Fortran program or whatever it is you want to do on the HPC system, you specify it in the scheduling script. That is something what we will come to in a moment. Then you basically are put to these systems. And in this way, you don't have to think about that. Oh, I didn't copy this hello point C program there, or I didn't copy my code there. This is done by the scheduler. It takes care of these kind of simple things of making, of course, your program available of those cores where you've been executed. The scheduler also does much more things and I cannot take this all basically and, and demonstrate this all in this, let's say, smaller lecture part here today. Um, of course, you have to specify maybe memory requirements. They are so-called jobs which are compute intensive or compute bound but others are rather memory bound and we will go to some examples throughout the course and and then the scheduler also is basically aware of this you can specify this how much memory you need how much you know cpu power you need and this is also granted however the third part as i said uh, the third part in ingredients may be to really realize that you can use it a little bit for planning right you see here the kind of schedule of the whole system. You see essentially how much load is to be expected in the next 24 hours. And this looks quite, frankly speaking, very positive. You have seen in the previous ones here, we have been quite, let's say, fully loaded already, maybe over a couple of days where we expect I don't get any job done because I will be just scheduled after those, right? Here, it's still rather positive. So we see, okay, when I now submit something, there's empty space and I would be probably very certain to be scheduled. Hence, you can also plan and foresee your workload. And this is how people think about sometimes. People go to Christmas, they want to have vacation, but on the other hand, there are less scientists working maybe on the machine. So, and there are bigger holes, as I would call it, in the schedule. So they would say, okay, well, I can use this machine over Christmas with let's say a three day job, a two day job, just executing one after another because nobody's using it. When you're at the high time, maybe a very important HPC conference, then you can imagine the systems are very full and your schedule will be very tight so that you basically be scheduled only in a couple of you know hours. If you're very bad in luck, you maybe have just some slot in the next day. However, if user cancels those jobs, what you can do in HPC. If it's not started yet, why not cancel it? If I maybe know I did already something wrong, then there's a possibility of backfilling. So that means when there's a hole in the schedule and your job would fit, although you're much, maybe much more later than others, but the others don't actually fit in the number of cores and your job fits in the number of cores, you will be scheduled earlier to fill this hole, right? To, to really use the capacity that's available to you. But this really goes into an area called scheduling policies. And this would require another lecture and another lecture. And we don't want to really go there. So let's get a little bit more practical what we can use here in the system now um, again. But it was very important to really understand that scheduling and monitoring, it's actually both ways in a way, if you think about LLView and the thing that we got just sought. I also want to give you 
a small idea of um, how that is differently from all the systems, because essentially we see here an HPC environment, which is uh, following this, you know, scheduling principles. And of course, and also has to do something what I already alluded to is backfilling. But the real, uh, of course, thing I also want to say is that firstly, it's a program of its own and directly connected to the scheduler. So that this is based on XML and that there's a certain client behind it, um, you can already imagine. So there's directly from the load, let's say of the system, some, let's say data flowing to this graphic like illustration that we have here. And you see also that the look and feel of this is very similar, but the architecture of the HPC systems is keeps changing. Here we see a blue gene architecture, uh, very well recognized with this interestingly REC setup. But um, the key message to take away really from this program and also from the idea of, of this monitoring is that these systems, of course, keep changing. Now we have here some examples that show you that no matter what the HPC system is, the requirement to have really, you know, monitoring and to know where your system is located is always there. And, and you see that still by having different HPC architectures, the same concepts apply. You have a kind of queue where lots of jobs are in. You see it's a very filled queue here with a Ukraine system, a very older system, of course, a blue gene queue, but also out of date and out of service. But it's not the point here. The point is here to say you, no matter how much you move in the back in HPC in different systems, and there are different examples here in the uh, example section of uh, essentially here this LLVU2. When you go back in time, there's even a system called Europa, also already there. We had the same setup. We have multi-users. We have a scheduling queue with different jobs where we have to think how much holes are there. They're applying the scheduling principles first come first serve, but also backfilling every now and then if there's a hole in the schedule. So the same principles in HPC remain no matter what the HPC architecture is. Of course, now we have more complexity. These days we have uh, interesting enough different vendors, um, but was also the case actually in Europa, if you think a little bit um, uh, Bull was here together with Sun, for instance, and so on. And of course, the the idea of saying vendor or someone is just an integrator that puts different things together, which might be much more a better term because you know the CPUs are still maybe from Intel or the graphic cards, as you know, are from Nvidia. These days, of course, are very different heterogeneous systems in a sense, but they all share in common the the same idea of the scheduling of a requirement to really monitor the systems and, and so forth. Here you see a system, for instance, also equipped with some graphic cards. You see the main load on the normal you know, CPU, but also then the load on the GPU, which is, as I told you in one of the earlier lectures and also as a reminder of the last lecture, it always needs to operate with the whole CPU, this device, this kind of graphic device. So this means also um, there's an interesting thing about the scheduling, right? So when you think about this, but we will look at this much more in detail. This was just a short demonstration to think about, you know, that these HPC architectures are different, but however, the idea of using backfilling, using first come first serve in scheduling principles, this idea of a queue, right? Is, is, is everywhere present. More or less today, people have started to use interactive supercomputing. If you remember, this was also one part of our previous lectures. Um, this is getting more and more attractive, but not so much on the very high scale. So you would use a couple of cores or so to have, let's say, an interactive access to these HPC systems. By large, the most uh, modes of operation are still this kind of queues, the scheduling of users by using, you know, essentially several straddling strategies. And uh, we will see how that materialized when I demonstrate it now. So let's go and take a tour because this would be also a practical lecture. So I will give you some examples what to do. You remember from the first part of the lecture, we had this interesting C program. We had this um, admittedly very simple C program here with Hello World 
uh, it gives just hello world and you know and writes it out not very sophisticated and we have seen we can execute it on the uh, let's say um, dire directly on the node that we have here however the point is also um, that we basically should not do that right so the idea of actually um, basically uh, using a supercomputer is not exactly using just this um, hello C and actually this is uh, was a small error you see we don't want to execute the C program we want to execute the executable sorry for this um, and you see our hello world but this is not how you should do it um, the idea of the second part of the lecture is to think about scheduling and for this we need a so-called scheduling script and it is in my recommendation for you in the course uh, best to really name it that way so you would say maybe submit hello punkt sh punkt sh stands for a shell script that we have here and it has specific commands that you need to use so there's no flexibility no recommendation this is a must this must be the same way as you see here of course there's some flexible matters you will see in the next couple of courses and actually lectures we have together we will increase the number of cores the number of systems the number of nodes uh, this minus n is here just one example of using one um, then we basically see we have some options of getting notified for instance here when the job has ended we maybe want to have an email so when you want to try out this practical lecture please don't use my email address use your own email address otherwise i'm getting flooded by notifications from you know you as a user on the supercomputer however i encourage you to use this and really to get it into your you know bloodstream because this will be the same way how you do all the assignments in the course right you always have to have the sub job scripts um, basically you have also a way of naming this jobs here also guess goes one recommendation uh, take the name that is a little bit you know related to your job because you will have maybe several jobs running um, and if you all call them hello example and you have maybe six or seven jobs running and you're debugging or whatever in your code when you do our assignments like for instance we will have an ocean simulation together in one of the assignments then my recommendation is name them a little bit you say hello example uh, 16 meaning that maybe 16 is your domain decomposition you choose uh, 16 different tiles we will talk about this in later lectures uh, specifically uh, lecture three about domain decomposition so this is let's say really information for the scheduler except the first line which is actually just pointing out uh, from terms uh, basically that is a kind of a, a bash script here but that is always what you can take over but you have to change the number of you know cpus the number of cores and also of your course your job name and your email address but these are kind of meta information for the schedule to work with the script so it's not something is done really when it's something done it's something like this and here's an example which links nicely to the things we learned before the module right of course now think about that what we did interactively together here in this lecture today when i did it in the command line module load gnu open mpi um, now we're going to not the log into node where I did this menu we go to some compute node somewhere on the cluster we have no idea where we are this is taken care by the scheduler so this means this compute CPU needs to know that we want to use the open MPI module the open MPI module requires the GNU model uh, module so that's why basically I have to load them both on this compute entity far far away somewhere deep in the cluster so here is something actually done it prepares the environment to be executing and to know what actually mpi run is to know basically the things we basically need within the c code that we basically have here admittedly it's just simple c so we don't really need mpi in the sense we don't really need mpi run because we don't have really mpi code but it prepares our assignment for uh, basically our environment for our assignments later so that's why we do it right here in the practical lecture you see another very important thing you have to specify exactly which code you want to execute and in previous lectures 
And, you know, from the production experience, people would do just the one that is in the working directory right now. People have some other structures. Um, here for the course, I really recommend you to get awareness and to take lessons learned into account from the last, you know, maybe uh, seven, eight years we're teaching this. Um, it's important to think about that you really put the full path. You remember you could do the following when you go out of this. You can always have the PWD, which means your working directory. So you know where is exactly your parallel code. So we have this PWD working directory, home Morris 2021 HPC course, MPI, hello. Hello is a directory here. And we have the hello executable. Hence, as a frequently asked questions from the last years, we have hello, hello here. So here we really, on the one hand, have the full path and then the hello as the executable. But of course, you don't have to do it like this normally. But at the course, I would recommend to do so. This really uh, gets rid of several questions I got in many years in the past where people said, I executed this particular executable. It's not doing what I want. And it's actually used normal for beginners to fall into this trap. They think they have changed the C code, so now everything should happen. But when you name, for instance, the C code hello2, and you specify it in the job script still hello, then the same old code will be executed, not the hello2. So you have to exactly, I mean, it seems plausible, of course, for many of you, and uh, but still taking into account that these errors are done incredibly often, especially if you don't have a very good directory here or here. Right. If you have mixed codes, you have, let's say, 20 times hello or 20 times your assignment code. And after a while, you have no idea actually what is which code. You maybe take a break one week and then come back and you mem don't remember which code you have, you know, basically running. Hence, use a naming really well and also use basically a very smart strategy here of basically not only providing the fully named path, but also maybe name your executables the right way. Okay, so this goes for more recommendations and lessons learned in the past. So let's submit a job because you also want to see something running. The same steps I'm actually demonstrating to you with the content here is on the slides for you. Uh, much more important is now what we do. And this is also captured as a right way of doing it. Right. You remember in the first part, we had the wrong way to do it. That means it's executing it on basically your um, login note. No, that's not what we're going to do. Here we have a certain command for a scheduler called S batch, which requires a certain job script that we basically just have edited together and looked at together. And when you do this, what you get back is usually a kind of job ID. It's unique, so only you receive this particular ID, and that's the C job ID that you can use for tracking your job. How far is it? Um, there's another command where you can look inside the queue. You remember the queue is now with different users, right? So many people want to use a supercomputer. And here's a very good example. You see Vida, uh, who is a professor in physics, is using this system. If there's not another Vida, but I think he is into HPC, and that might be him. So he is using Uturn and I using Uturn. I using it with hello example, he using probably some physics code. And it's still running in his part of the code, probably because it's some proper physics code and needs, let's say, different iterations and you know will take some time to really be computed on Uturn. However, if you have the hello example, you can imagine just to point and print one hello world is not a big issue. So here we see it's already completed. The other art you see is, which is a, perhaps a little bit different for you to understand, is of course now you don't have a direct output, right? You have seen, oh my God, I actually submitted it and now it's so completed, but my output is missing. So, I mean, this is usually the reaction I got from people when I do live demonstrations or when I basically do courses in class, right? People are wondering. So I executed it and it was completed. It's all running fine. So what's the issue? The point is that you redirected the output to a certain output file. You see that here, the different types of these files. 
And of course, here you have seen a kind of connection to the job ID you executed to, right? We did here an S batch submit hello world. And what we get is a job ID. And with this unique job ID, you can track what's happening with your job. So there's an output file and the name of the output file can be even changed or the path, the location can be changed. But what we expect from this output file would be now exactly the same thing we would see otherwise on the screen. Right, so if you do more, that's a command that is a little bit more simpler to look into the files. You see now that if you use the one that we just executed um, and the out, you see hello world. And the same we would see if you just executed on the login node, what you would never do, of course, in the future. You just learned that from me, that's possible. The way to go is always to do, let's say, s pitch. The beautiful thing is with this, I could do this all the time, right? And think about that many people would do so, maybe not necessarily with the exact same code as I did here, this is a bit stupid, but they would do it with different parameter sets, they would do it with different maybe versions of the codes. So this is common practice that you have maybe different parts, you know, running like Vita is doing with VG1, VG2, could be different parameters, could be a different executable and to have different jobs. And you don't care about this because the scheduler will be just scheduling it as he wants. And once it's finished, you see here, we are again, very nicely, quickly computed and completed directly because it's not a big job anymore. While Vita's job keep on running, I have my jobs completed. So I have all my outputs matching, of course, then this job IDs that you see here with the outputs that are here. You see, so it's a very strong system. And because this has been into production for many years, you can expect it would work, let's say 99.9%. .9%. There might be always maybe some issue with the scheduler. And this could be often related to some error in the file system. It could be an error in the compute nodes. And another error I would just to address as a final statement here before we stop uh, is essentially, of course, what happens if you now did an error in the job script, let's say, we have the PWD and we say we are in the MPI hello, right? A directory here in our course. So what happens when I say, well, I'm, I actually did this wrong, right? So it's not MPI. I actually mix it up as OpenMP or um, you would say it's maybe something completely different. I put here for fun OpenMP um, and then would say, okay, um, that's my path and I don't have it in my mind. So essentially we point you now to something which is not existing. And basically if you do now the S batch, um, we would expect there's something wrong here, right? So we have also here, you can do of course a more submit. You see the job script, we point it to OpenMP, then we, don't, we do the S batch and we would see there should be an error or something like this. But wait a moment, it's just a scheduler nothing is yet executed. So of course you don't get immediate feedback that there's an error. All you get is, yeah, I know there's a job, a batch job. I will put it in the queue and we have to wait. You get an ID and we have to go from there. So I look into my queues on the system. I see, okay, the one I executed with this particular number. Oh, okay, it was already completed. So maybe there was nothing wrong with the job. So let's look in the output file. Now, when you see the output file already, you see a kind of an indicator, right? So you have this 12 size and suddenly the much bigger size is already points to, aha, uh -huh, there's something fishy. So let's look into this by doing more slurm and exactly this particular doc, um, ID, uh, file three and then out and you see MPI run was unable to launch this application because it was actually on the compute node 2.2, right? So somewhere on the system, they couldn't access this executable. And this was right because there is no executable at this. The other parts of this, this process ranks zero. This materializes when we think a little bit about MPI in the next lecture. But that's really, I think, the main essence I wanted to leave you on the table for you. You have to really think for two things, write everything explicitly correct, especially when it's about path. One capital letter versus a small letter can make a difference. One directory or not can make a difference. 
then please use in all the assignments the S batch, right? Use the scheduler with a job script. Don't work on the login node, then you're on the safe side. The scheduler will take your job script as you see here, then put it on some compute node, um, as you have seen compute 22, for instance, there's an example, and then suddenly after some waiting, this you can always query with QStat, right? You will know, okay, is my job completed or still running? Then you essentially see, okay, there's a output file. And then if you go into it, you will see either there's an error or it has been working fine. This is of course something which we will see throughout the assignments when you do that on your own. Um, this is really not the most complex thing. It will be always the same modus operandi, so to speak. In this sense, I think you're very well prepared to learn more about parallel computing. This so far was not much on parallel computing, just the basics and the pre, let's say, setup on this. And we will talk in the next lecture of lecture two, really, how we do parallel programming first conceptually, and then we will have another practical lecture. That's all for today and see you basically next week.